Today's workshop is about a key question. Are we entering a new macroeconomic regime? That is, how different will be the future ahead of us from the past? Over the last 40 years, advanced countries have been growing and developing within the so-called Great Moderation Regime. The Great Moderation was the joint outcome of improved economic policy management and favorable supply side shocks. Increasing potential growth, reducing production costs, and leading to a prolonged period of low and stable inflation. As the historical experience showed, a sizable swing in asset prices occurred despite an environment with high macrofinancial stability potential. The Great Moderation Regime could have ended due to the persistent deterioration of global supply chains and rising energy prices caused by the pandemic crisis and the Russian war in Ukraine. These adverse supply side developments could persist to a larger extent in the future due to the globalization, reducing international trade and technological capital and migration flows. Climate change and environmental degradation pose further threats in terms of extreme weather disruptions to economic activity and harvests and the spread of new pandemic waves. Energy prices might be further subject to increases as the green transition appears to occur before the supply of renewable resources can adequately meet energy demand. A secular inflation or even a great stagflation regime might then be ahead of us. Against these scenarios, the workshops aims to present and discuss recent scientific results and advance policy solutions. In the morning session, Mike will give us insights into the medium to long-term developments in the post-pandemic global economy, while Agostino, Daniel, and Roberta will tell us about the short-term policy challenges. The technical session in the afternoon will open with Tommaso's assessments of the origin of inflation, followed by four contributions by Andrea Gino, Silvia, and myself concerning evolving macrofinancial risks. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Mike Spence. Mike Spence uh, is a senior professor of economics at Bocconi University and SDA Bocconi School of Management. He's also a senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution and a Philip H. Nye Professor Emeritus of Management at the Graduate School of Business. Spence is also a commissioner for the Global Commission on Internet Governance. He's also a member of the Bergruen Institute 23rd Century Council. His research activity is uh, focused on the job market signaling model, which inspired research into this branch of contract theory. Spence attended Princeton University as an undergraduate student in philosophy. He then studied mathematics as a postgraduate student at the University of Oxford. He received a PhD in economics from Harvard University in 1972, completing a dissertation titled Market Signaling under the supervision of Kenneth Arrow and Thomas Schelling. He was awarded the David A. Wells Prize for an outstanding doctoral dissertation in the same year. He is an author of three books and 50 articles and has also been a consistent contributor to Project Syndicate and International Newspaper Syndicate since 2008. Together with George Akerlof and Joseph Siglitz, Spence is a co-recipient of the 2001 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for their analysis of markets with asymmetric information. Mike, thank you very much again for being with us today. The floor is yours. So my part in this is um, to try to talk about, you know, the world that we're going to live in, mainly from an economic point of view. Um, after we not only exit the pandemic, which we largely through and having China just having opened up, but also after the inflation fight is over in some sense. Um, and, I'm going to try to I, I'm going to try to convince you that something fundamental is is actually changing because of secular um, trends. And this kind of short version of it is that we we are moving quite rapidly, and with the pandemic kind of pre producing confusion along the way, from a demand constrained world where there were essentially no supply constraints to a supply constrained world, um, and that's just a hugely different world, regardless of whether you're in business or the financial sector or an asset management or in a central bank and in the policy world. Now, I don't expect everybody to believe that, but I'm going to try to cover enough data um, so that you can reach your own your own conclusions. Um, does this work? Yes. All right. So let me uh, very brief comment at the start. Um, I think you all know what the MDGs and SDGs are. The MDGs 
were uh, goals set by the United Nations in the year 2000, Millennium Development Goals. They focused mo mostly on the developing world. They ended 15 years later. Um, and for the most part, that was a stunningly successful period. Uh, during that period, a very large fraction of the, the world's developing economies moved from uh, essentially low income to middle income. Not all, uh, there's still work to do. Um, and there were big improvements in health outcomes and so on. It was a, it was a, notwithstanding the global financial crisis, it was a stunningly successful period in the developing world. But by that time, after the global financial crisis, the rising awareness of the seriousness of the um, climate um, agenda and so on, the SDGs, which came in 2015, were designed not just for the developing world, but for everybody. So that the fundamental change here is the is the recognition of global interdependence in multiple dimensions, including the sustainability one, um, and the recognition that there are common problems. There are potential instabilities, there's uh, uh, an income distribution problem and so on. And so the sustainable development goals were, they're, I, they're called goals. I, I think they're best thought of as metrics uh, that one can use to sort of think about whether we're making progress or not. And the the uh, the only thing I would add to that is that, you know, in the last two or three years, I think there's uh, uh, there are enough shocks to the global economy that you would have to add to inclusive and sustainable uh, and secure, you'd have to add secure uh, to the agenda. Oh, I turned off the mic rather than move the slides. This comes from the work that Piketty and company do, um, and I find it a useful graph. So this is a picture of the world's situation with respect to inequality. Um, and it, the two lines are inequality associated with uh, uh, between country differences, that's the blue line, and the red line is within country. So the red line was pretty flat. The blue line uh, rose steadily, since the start of the industrial revolution essentially to the end of the uh the, the first the second world war and then it rose a bit more because the developing countries that started growing at that point were growing fast enough and were big enough um, to make a difference and then there's this very fundamental uh point which is the late 1970s right around 1980 in which both of these patterns kind of reversed right so the within country inequality started that had been falling had start, started to rise dramatically in the between country, uh, you know, inequality started to fall. Um, the falling of the between country, you know, is basically the convergence process of the emerging economies to, not to, but closer to where we, we live and work in the, in the developed economies and the rising inequality, which is not unrelated structurally to that, um, it, because of globalization and display movement of jobs and so on, started started to rise. Um, and initially, it didn't receive much attention, but it's um, getting more attention now, <laughs> um, for good reason. It's it's you know many people believe um, Daniel and others have written about this that it's uh, one of the causes of political so and social polarization. I just turned off the mic. I'm hopeless. Okay, now. Why am I keep? <laughs> All right. Well, can you go frontwards? There we go. Yeah. Uh, left, click, left click to go forward. Left click to go forward. Okay. I won't belabor this. I think you all know this data. Um, but I wanted to just emphasize the magnitude of the sustainability challenge. We are now globally at um, 36 billion tons uh, of carbon dioxide emissions, fossil fuel related emissions, production based for those of you who pay attention to the, these differences between production and consumption. Um, and we have not, not peaked. Uh, so where are we? Well, the United States is coming down, but at a per capita level is very high. Europe is performing much better. It's about half the per capita of the United States. It's on a steady downward trend. China is expected to peak. China is by far the largest emitter now by a factor of about two, um, is expected to peak by 2030. I looked at the aggregates, the carbon intensity 
of the global economy declined in the last decade at a rate of about 2% a year globally, right? So that means that if you have going forward, if that trend continues and we have relatively weak 2% real growth in the global economy, then we will stay flat. The International Energy Agency has produced a really remarkably detailed study of what milestones you have to meet between now and 2050 to hold us to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and the milestone at 2030 is 26 billion tons rather than 36 billion tons. Um, you know, that would, that would, in order to achieve that, you would need to have the carbon intensity of the global economy decline at almost 8% a year. I don't know how many in this room think that's going to happen, but I'm not one of them. <laughs> so I think you can say goodbye, at least in the short to medium term, to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which means that we're going to have um, increasingly uh, experience of climate shocks uh, of the type that we're now kind of familiar with. Uh, there we go. Here are the top emitters. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but you can see the data. I'll leave these behind. Um, and this is uh, peaks and growth in CO2 emissions again. I've, I've pretty much covered this. Now I, want, now I want to talk about the kind of growth prospects going forward. Again, you know, we, we know that we, we are living in a world that you know, has lots of shocks, and we know we're living in a world, I mean, the, the, the main event from a macroeconomic point of view is inflation, right? And we know that central banks can, um, through their interest rate policies, uh, and declining balance sheets, they can choke off enough demand to get rid of inflation. Now, you know, th th that's easy to say, and it's hard to do without crashing the economy, but the short run is clear, right? We are going to have slow growth until we get inflation under control. Um, the World Bank projections last June for global growth were 3%. They revised them down to 1.7%. Uh, there's a lot of talk about recessions. I, who knows? <laughs> whether we're going to have a recession in North America or in Europe. Uh, I can tell you that there's going to be economic trouble in a good chunk of the uh, developing country world, especially in the low-income countries. They are destabilized. Um, and if in, when we come to questions, if any of you are interested in that, we can spend more time. Now, the question is whether the, the trigger for this inflation was um, excess demand. It's a demand supply imbalance. That's not the whole story, but that's the starting point. Um, and and the, the belief was that there were transitory factors associated with the pandemic um, that gave rise to supply blockages that, and, and, and in conjunction with a big demand surge, uh, was causing the inflationary pressure. And the hope was that those supply blockages would go away fast enough so that supply would behave the way it has for most of the last 30 or 40 years, um, and that is come back and meet the demand. Um, the demand surge was partly just pent up demand, partly government policies designed to buffer the shock, kept household balance sheets in pretty good shape. I mean, you know, it's hard to say pretty good shape when you're talking about a pandemic, but it wasn't bad. Uh, and, and then there were these big fiscal programs in the United States, they were absolutely huge, uh, you know, both on the investment side and so on. So you had a surge and you had a warning and warning came from Larry Summers and Olivier Blanchard, Mohamed Alary, and a number of people said, no, you know, the, this is gonna produce excess demand and inflationary pressure. That didn't dispose of the transitory part um, until about, you know, nine months later. And then everybody woke up and said, geez, it's not going away. Well, it is partly going away. So, you know, there are transitory elements to the supply constraints. Um, you know, ocean shipping costs at the high point reached $10,000 per container um, when the norm was 2,000 or less before the pandemic. They're now back down to about 3,000 and there's no reason to expect that this won't normalize. And there are others, you know, transitory elements. The supply chain bottlenecks are, are unwinding a little bit. You remember in the pandemic, you know, most of us experienced, you know, sort of walking our dog, you know, for three minutes when we were allowed outside and so on. But most of the businesses in the global system basically went into survival mode. Well, what do you do in survival mode? Well, you cut inventories, you know, don't produce anything more than you think you might be able to sell. All the buffers 
all the buffers, and there aren't many uh, in the global supply chains, you know, we're sort of eliminated as part of this sort of survival mode uh, behavior. And all of a sudden, the, you know, the global economy starts to open up and those buffers are missing, right? So it isn't surprising you had supply chain congestion. In addition, you know, China stayed shut down with the zero COVID policy until the last two months. And everybody thought they were gonna wait until the, the, um, the, uh, the March, you know, uh, parliamentary meetings in the, in the kind of Chinese version, but actually with demonstrations and people just being fed up with a zero COVID policy and some pretty bad abuses associated with it, they decided they couldn't stick it out that long. So they just opened up. Um, it's nobody has any idea. My Chinese friends tell me we will never know how many people are going to die as a result of this, that, you know, they're just not going to be able to keep track, but the economy is bouncing back really, really quickly. And that's a big deal. I mean, China is, you know, I think all of you know, about 80% the size of the European or American or North American economies. And so when it, you know, comes back into the system, it will make a very big difference. But, and now I come to the part where you may not be convinced so I'm gonna spend some time on this, but I wanna argue there are secular trends um, that make the notion that we are gonna mean revert to the, the pre-pandemic normal unlikely. Um, so the first, these are the, the items on the list. Um, and I don't know exactly how to tackle this. So, you know, I, I'm not gonna just stay on this slide, but, I, but, but I, I'll spend a little time on it. Um, for most of the last 40 years, certainly since China decided to join the, the global economy, we've experienced essentially demand constrained growth. Why? Because we brought it just enormous amounts of previously unused productive capacity into the global economy. You know, if you don't believe me, go and look at the, the trade data in manufacturing. China is 30% of global manufacturing just wasn't there before 40 years ago, right, et cetera. And they're not the only ones. Um, that process, you know, which is associated with developing country growth, adding, at least in the manufacturing part of the global economy, added enormous amounts of supply. Um, if you go look at price indices, and I'll show them in, to in a minute, basic, well, I'll do it, show it to you now. This is a picture of price changes in the American economy from 1997 to 2007. The red lines are things that got very expensive. They're not things that are supplied in the global manual. The embarrassing one here is college, <laughs> education, education in general, healthcare, um, all had rising, uh, rising costs, very rapidly rising costs, much higher than the overall price index. And what fell? Manufactured goods, cars, clothing, software, semiconductors, and anything that uses them, TVs, right? These things went down in nominal terms, in terms of cost, when the price index was going up by 55 or 56%. It means the real decline was just enormous. That's the, that's the first order effect of this sort of supply conditions. Well, what happens in, in a developing country you know, for those of you who've studied it, you know this. Um, in the early stages of growth, basically, you have a whole bunch of people working in traditional sectors like agriculture, and there's surplus labor. Uh, this is what Sir W. Arthur Lewis, a Nobel laureate in uh, development economics in the 1980s, I think, said. And so the, the, the development model is largely bringing those people into the modern part of the economy, which is built mainly for exports because domestic demand isn't very big. Um, when they cross that boundary, productivity rises and, and growth starts. And the growth rates are stunning, by the way. You know, it's easy to find extended periods like 25 years of six or 7% growth when this process is running at high speed. Uh, it doesn't run everywhere for reasons that we don't have time to spend you know, on today. But that process goes on for at least a couple of decades. And then at some point, you can't keep taking surplus labor out of the traditional sectors. And, and you start to have to rely on different growth drivers, namely productivity growth in the rest of the economy. Um, and that transition you know, from, from the kind of Lewis growth model 
to the growth model you need in a middle or high income country is called the Lewis turning point. Um, you hear it talked about all the time, especially if you spend time in China. What I'm trying to tell you is that there's an element of what we're facing is that there's something similar going on in the global economy. That is, we do not have an inexhaustible supply of unused productive resources. Now, you know, we could spend some time on this. You know, there are unused productive resources that are potentially deployable in the low income countries, in Africa, in some other continents, um, maybe in India, depending on what their development model is. But it doesn't look very likely that this will come on stream fast enough to relax the, um, the supply constraints. Um, so that's point one. Point two is aging. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, not all of the world is aging, as, but, but all of the developing countries, developed countries are aging, and China is aging, and Russia, uh, if it decides to rejoin the global economy. And when, so when you look at these economies and ask, well, what fraction of the world's population lives there? The answer is about a third. But if you ask what fraction of the world's GDP, meaning output, comes from these countries, the answer is almost 80%, right? So, it's, so if you think about this in secular terms, right, the short run, most of the productive capacity in the world is in these economies that are aging rapidly. And what does that mean? It means the labor force is shrinking. It means the dependency ratios are rising. It means some kind of fiscal pressure depending on the social security systems. And one thing that isn't talked about is that most people when they retire don't die instantly, I hope. Um, at least I'm getting near that point, uh, which means that supply contra contracts, but if the balance sheets are in deep sh good enough shape, the demand doesn't shrink, right? So you have an automatic, semi-automatic mechanism um, so this is a, sec a second, you know, sort of source of, of this kind of thing. The third is, and I'm going to spend a little time on this, I apologize, this comes from American data, um, but it's important for me to cover because it sets up um, what I want to talk about in the last few minutes. Um, there's no question there's a declining productivity trend, you know, pretty much everywhere you look. It's true in Europe. It's true in North America. Uh, it's true in China. It's pretty much global. Now, there are a few counter you know, things. I think Indian productivity is rising. India is probably the, the highest potential growth economy at this point um, in the global economy and is you know, in, in prospect to be big enough to have you know, material consequential impacts on the, on the rest of the global economy. Um, but they've got a little ways to go until then. Um, so what is this a picture of? When I, what I, let me back up. What I want to convince you with is it's not useful to think about productivity at a kind of macroeconomic level. You need to dig deeper. So what some co-authors and I have done once before, 10 years ago, and are now updating, and this isn't published yet, um, is we, they're dismantling a developed economy, in this case, the United States economy by sector, and asking two questions. One, how much employment is in that sector? And two, how much value added? Val forgive me for value added, but va value added is basically, you know, what you sell, what a sector sells minus purchased inputs, not including labor or capital, right? So it's the capital and labor that creates the value. It, the reason we do that is that so it adds up to the GDP. Um, otherwise you're double counting, right? All the intermediates get double counted uh, and you don't want to do that. So we dismantled the economy by major sectors. Uh, and we, we, we've done this um, with an overlay, which I think some of you may have thought about, maybe many of you haven't. Um, and that is we decided the economy, including within sectors into a tradable, meaning internationally tradable, goods and services, things that trade internationally um, and things that don't. So roughly speaking, in the American economy, I may have a graph on this, I'll show, in which case I'll show you. Uh, yeah, somewhere in here, here. So the blue, it, this is um, the tradable sector. 
So the tradable sector in the United States economy is in terms of value added is about a third. Um, that's normal for a developed economy. The, the structure of an economy in this dimension is determined by demand. Uh, and you know, and on the non-tradable side, demand and supply have to be equal. <laughs> there's, no, there's no trading and specialization. Um, in terms of employment, it's just over 20% of employment. Um, this part of the America, and it's about half manufacturing and half services, the trade, what, what services trade, consulting, managing multinational enterprises, designing, designing computers, uh, aspects of the legal profession, uh, pretty much all R&D now can be conducted, you know, sort of on an international basis. Um, these are tend to be the high income sectors in the economy. Uh, um, the interesting thing about this, this part of the economy is that the productivity growth, that's, this is the blue line, value added per person employed. It's the simplest measure of kind of productivity in terms of people producing value. value. The, the productivity growth is almost 3% in real terms over this 20 year period. That's not bad. If the whole economy were performing that way, we wouldn't be wringing our hands about productivity. Uh, the problem is in the non-tradable sector and it's huge. It's two thirds of the economy and 80% almost of the employment. And it has the big employment sectors in it. What are those? It depends on the economy you're looking in, but they're pretty easy to identify. Government, education, healthcare, uh, hospitality, traditional retail. These, the, the, those five sectors uh, in the United States economy account for 45% of total employment and 56% of employment in the non-tradable sector. And the productivity growth in that sector is very low. Now, sometimes it's just impossible to measure. Government productivity, you can't measure because we don't sell anything, <laughs> right? So that it was, you might wonder, you know, well, where, where's the, how do you calculate value in the government sector? The answer is you add up the cost and assume the value is equal to the cost, essentially, is what goes on. Uh, I'll come back to this, bit, but if, if we're going to solve the problem of uh, uh, changing the trajectory of growth because of these supply constraints, the productivity problem is going to have to be part of the solution. Uh, and, and a productivity problem, at least in a fairly large number of economies, is going to have to focus on sectors that have been largely immune from productivity increases in the past. Um, so that, well, I think this is, I've covered this. In, there, are, there are a few additional things that, that I want to cover that, you, you know, when I'm, I'm asking you to add these up in your head. Sovereign debt ratios have risen steadily uh, since before this, the great financial crisis. They rose dramatically in the great financial crisis. They did not decline after that. There was no significantly de deleveraging um, in the global economy for a lot of different reasons. One of them is that China went from very low leverage economy to a very high leverage economy and it's big. Um, and then the pandemic produced another big surge. In, um, in debt levels, particularly sovereign debt levels. So this is a world in which fiscal space is declining. Um, if you add to that a world um, in which interest rates are rising, especially if they stay up in real terms, and that's an important question. I mean, I don't pretend to have an answer to that, but I think the markets, if I read them right, are assuming we have an ugly inflation fight, but when we come out of it, we'll go back to where we were you know, with a kind of nearly zero real interest rate um, or what the, you know, monetary people call R star. Uh, my best guess is that's not where we're going back, uh, that there'll be continuous potential inflationary pressures that will require demand constraint um, and a higher real interest rate, but who knows. Uh, but this is not a world in which there's as much flexibility as there was before with respect to either buffering shocks or, e or even generating uh, you know, investments that are designed to produce long-term growth. So for example, you could ask yourself on the context of the sustainable development agenda, 
where is the $3.5 trillion of incremental investment that's required to achieve the sustainable development goals going to come from in this world with rising interest rates, high debt ratios, and so on. Presumably, a, a portion of that has to come from the public sector. Uh, but it isn't obvious that there's a huge amount of space um, there. These are, again, you know, questions that I don't have complete answers to, but I think are worth thinking about. Um, and the bottom line is there's a lot of pressure. Um, let me flip back and just make sure I've covered the main elements of, of this. This, by the way, I'll leave this behind. This is a picture, this is my crude version of the, of the Lewis turning point, right? You have a long flat section of a long run supply. Um, so basically when you get a demand increase, the, 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 the all but the very short run response is a quantity response. And then the supply turns up. Again, don't over process this. <laughs> Um, I think the only other thing that I, I wanted to mention in this context is that, I, I mean, there's some things that, you know, there's been serious research on industrial concentration, degrees of competition, do we have enough competition and innovation and so on. But I think the other big, big important trend is the world is subject to um, in, increasing shocks from multiple sources, increasing in frequency and severity. Most people think climate correctly <laughs> in that context, but you have geopolitical tensions, you have the pandemic, you have you know financial instability, and there's lots of people who think we're gonna have some more financial instability, at least in, in a subset of the emerging economies uh, as a result of fragility created by, by the pandemic um, and so on. And, and the, 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 it isn't just the shocks that matter, it's the response and the response is um, you know i mean i didn't mention the ukraine war but <laughs> that's obviously another one the response is diversification right companies for the really for the first time are going to diversify uh their supply chains and and policy is driving in the same direction for the first time so for most of that 40 year period I referred to before, global supply chains were constructed almost entirely on efficiency and comparative advantage criteria, right? Essentially, because they were driven by private sector incentives and that's the way they came out. And they produced extraordinary results in terms of growth and development and employment and all kinds of other things and had some difficult side effects, including distributional ones. But but the message that you know I think the mar that is being delivered back to us is that world is no longer with us right, and when you add to that geopolitical tensions, um, that which are hard I think to get a kind of firm grip on, um, maybe dominated by the sort of relatively unconstructive relationship that's developed between the United States and China. Um, difficulties handling sensitive technologies especially digital ones because of their overlap you know with national security concerns um the the use by the united states mainly of uh economic and financial weapons to achieve non-economic non outcomes and so on i'm thinking of sanctions and and things like that you know trade restrictions and so on all of that um, is producing a, a world in which, you know, there's a rational response, which is to sort of protect yourself from that degree of uncertainty, um, but it's expensive, right? You know this in Europe. I mean, we're diversifying rapidly away from dependence on Russian fossil fuels, but nobody is arguing it, you know, in the short to medium term, it's cheap <laughs> to do that. LNG is not as cheap as, uh, as gas coming through a pipeline from Russia. It just isn't. Um, and so when you add all this up, you know, what the conclusion I come to is that these supply constraints, you know, from aging, from, you know, a different world out there in terms of supply conditions in the, in the emerging economies, et cetera, that, that there's a very good chance that these very high supply elasticities that we relied on um, for the better part of at least 30 years 
are not going to be there anymore. So the question is, you know, could could you run in the future? The question I, well, you can ask yourself. I, I won't pretend to give your answer to you. Could, in the next decade, as in the past decade, could you run with zero interest rates and massive asset purchases by central banks for the whole 10 years without incurring any risk in terms of inflation? Now, if you think the answer is yes, that means you don't believe anything I've said. <laughs> uh, but I think that's the question. Um, so let, let me, uh, if I haven't convinced you of that, then I, I, I won't have convinced you. But the one thing I would like you to, to, uh, to remember is the, the solution to this, I don't think there's any way around, you know, some degree of fragmentation in the global economy. There's no way around, you know, in the short to medium term shocks. Um, but there are two things that would make a difference. One is a better job of bringing um, more labor into the global economy. Uh, so in some places that means, you know, child care, like America, child care and more women in the economy. In some places it means getting rid of the obstacles like in the low income countries. So we have at least the potential um, for having that product productive capacity brought into the global economy in a way that it hasn't so far. Um, et cetera. Uh, but so that's part of it. The other part is productivity. We just have to reverse the productivity trends. And I hope I've convinced you that that, that has to be um, at least in part in these service sectors, many of which require people um, to be present. Okay. This is not the, for the most part, this is not the working from home crowd, right? It's not the high income crowd. The lowest income sectors in the United States our hospitality and retail, okay? Massive employers and, you know, and education is falling behind. In every one of these sectors right now, there are significant labor shortages. Why? Because people don't wanna work there, right? And they have alternatives. They have, they look at this and they say it's stressful or in America, I might get shot, you know? or it was unpleasant in the pandemic, or it's dangerous, or it's not flexible, and I want flexibility, the labor supply is not coming back in these sectors. And so for the first time in a long time, it makes sense, both for businesses and for policy to focus on the productivity. Now, so the question that I think that I'm focused on now is the following. Is that, are we, is the world I just described inevitable? Or is there some way out of this? And so I, well, all I'm going to do now is, to, nobody knows the answer to that, but I think there is at least a potential to do better on global interdependence. There's a potential to get more people in, the, you know, in, a, in a useful, you know, rewarding way uh, into the in global economy in a productive capacity. And I think there is potential for productivity change. Um, So there, so I, I'll just do this really, you know, relatively quickly. There are four, to me, there are four major transformations underway in the global economy that are even more fundamental than those secular trends that I just described. One of them is the shift of the global economy to the emerging economies and especially Asia. Asia has, you know, East and South um, has, I don't know, two thirds of the world's population. No. If the fertility rates in Africa stay as high as they are, that won't be true forever, right? But, uh, and so that's a concern because that's not a world that's um, yet growing at full potential. But for the, for the, the immediate future, th this means the center of gravity of the global economy is shifting there. And that has all kinds of implications in terms of global economic governance. They just can't be left out um, anymore. We need to reform the international institutions so that the governance looks a little bit like, you know, economic power and so on. And we're not very far along in that. Uh, the the other the other part is, you know, scientific and technological. So there's a huge multi-dimensional digital transformation of the global economy underway. You all know this. I'm not going to spend all you know your morning um, outlining the dimensions of it. Uh, but there are many, many of them, and they're quite fundamental. Um, there's a, 
huge energy transition that's underway. Um, you know, we can be optimistic or pessimistic about whether it's fast enough, but it's for sure underway and Europe is leading um, that transformation. And hopefully the rest of us won't be lagging behind too far. And the third one is somewhat less talked about, but it's important, which is, a, 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 I'll call it a revolution in biomedical and life sciences. Um, very broad, not just relevant to healthcare, but agriculture and other things. And these transformations are driven, being driven that I think everybody kind of vaguely knows what a, that that's true, but they're being driven by really powerful tools um, and technologies that have declining costs and increasing accessibility. Um, so for example, solar costs, when I first looked at this 10 years ago in the developing country context, they, they were not competitive. There was no way to convince India to use solar uh, in, in its massive incremental um, electricity generation, you know, process as a result of its intended growth. Um, now, you know, with the right smart grids and some improvements in storage, battery technology, and so on, it is uh, competitive or more than competitive. S same is true of wind. Uh, semiconductors, this is, some of you may have seen this, um, th this is um, PSMC is time on semiconductor manufacturing company. It is the most advanced sem semiconductor um, fabrication operation in the world. Um, they are, this is their product roadmap over a period of time. They are now either at or almost at semiconductors with that are characterized by three nanometers, which means there's three nanometers separation between the transistors on the chip. Now, most of us don't spend our days thinking about what that means. So there's another number on the right-hand side of that graph from your point of view. I think you can see it. It's under three, three, just over three nanometers. There's a number 291. Do you see that? Do you know what that is? Anybody? That's the number of transistors in millions per square millimeter on the chip, per square millimeter. So why is this important? These chips are fast, they're low energy, they're the chips that are required to do the most advanced artificial intelligence um, applications, particularly the training part. They're the ones that, are try that the United States is trying to keep China from getting because China can't make them um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's very it's very difficult. You need um, you know you need chip design technology from the UK. You need a a, a lithography technology that that comes from the Netherlands. Um, and so far, the United States has bullied everybody into refusing to sell them to China. Uh, but this 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 is you know these are they're, by the way the phone in your pocket is a five nanometer chip. Um, I won't spend any time on this. The most talked about recent advance is um, chat GPT. Uh, I don't think anybody has any idea what's going to, what the consequence of this, but it is stunning. Um, this is my own, right? I said, tell me about Christopher Columbus and coming to, the, to North America. And this is what it wrote. It's not stupid. Uh, my somewhat, you know, whimsical view of this is th this stuff happens so fast. You see, the, the way this works is basically the way all AI works. Uh, it, you know, it basically, they, you know, the machines, because they operate pretty fast and almost everything's digital now and the networks are high speed, they go read everything, you know, faster than any of us could imagine. Um, so they read a bunch of literature and the AIs are smart enough now that they kind of put together homes, you know, images, you know, art and stuff like that. But you know they do it so fast that I, I have this image that in ten years, the the training part, which is going and reading everything, they'll be reading stuff they already produced, <laughs> and not things that humans produced. And I don't know what that'll produce, but uh, probably nonsense. Um, this this one I'm pretty sure most many of you have not seen, but is stunning. Um, a a uh, 
uh, DeepMind is one of the two leading um, AI development labs in the world. It, this one's owned by Google. Um, the other one's OpenAI, it's in San Francisco. Microsoft just invested $10 billion in it. it, it OpenAI is, is chat GPT technology. Um, these guys, you know, became well known when they basically won the game of Go against, <laughs> not that anybody cares. Um, but uh, one of their latest efforts is uh, basically they took the amino acid sequence that defines a protein and asked themselves the question, can we predict it, this protein's three-dimensional structure? This is something that scientists can do in a lab, but it's very laborious and tough and can take months. And they tried it and it worked. Uh, it's not perfect. It may, you know, AIs are prediction machines, basically, right? So the prediction doesn't come necessarily with 100%, but it's pretty high percent, and and it works. Uh, and James Manika, who's now at Google from McKinsey, told me they they have predicted the three dimensional structure of most of the known proteins. Uh, it's in the tens and tens of millions. I don't know exactly how many. And it's open source, right? Anybody, any scientist in the world can go look up their prediction of the structure of a protein. And, and it, while this doesn't sound like it's very important in our world, but in the world of biological research, this is just a stunning productivity uh, achievement. Um, this is image recognition. A friend of mine at Stanford is a woman named Fei Fei Li one of the leading AI people in the world. She's the founder of ImageNet. Um, ImageNet is the entity that runs the competition on, um, on um, basically image recognition. You know, the ability of an AI to look at a picture and say, you know, there are no cats here, or this is a lion, or, you know, this is a ladder, et cetera. And this is a picture of how um, these AIs performed starting in 1910 uh, or 2010. In 2010, they weren't very good. Uh, they Somewhere in the middle of this, they switched to the current version of AI, which is essentially studying thousands of millions of images and, and detecting pattern. It's pattern recognition in them. Um, and they basically around 2015, they passed humans, right? So. Part of this facial recognition, it's done in a slightly different way with you know real parameters and so on. Um, you might say, well, that's cute, who cares? Well, actually, it turns out you can't have autonomous vehicles. You can't detect skin cancer from images, you know, on an automated basis, et cetera. I mean, this is just incredibly important. You can't have a modern robot that can't see, right? Is this just core? for technology and it's widely available. Um, here's DNA sequencing. This is, DNA sequences costs came down on a pattern that resembles Moore's law for semiconductors until about 2008. And then they started dropping like a stone. So the first one was like hundred million. Uh, we're at $250 per DNA sequence now. Core, core, basic core uh, feature of, uh, you know, biological research. These are the two women who received the Nobel Prize in, um, in chemistry two years ago for essentially discovering gene editing, only that's not what they were trying to do. In, does it, do any of you know what they were trying to do? They were studying bacteria. And bacteria are routinely um, attacked um, by viruses. And as an evolutionary matter, ba bacteria learned to cut the virus up, the DNA, and incorporate it in its own DNA so they had a library of dangerous viruses. And that cutting up process, when they, when they figured out how they did it, is, is the process called CRISPR um, for doing gene editing. And finally, in terms of, you know, the impact of these things, there is, a, this is really stunning. I used to live in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley was probably one of the, you know, the places where there was advanced technology development, you know, uh, and applications and companies that created them. You could count those locations 15 years ago on the fingers of your hands. 
Um, it just isn't true anymore. It's become a, glo a really a global phenomenon, especially, well, in all three areas I've mentioned, but especially the digital one. Um, so this is a count of unicorns. These are companies that get to a billion dollar valuation um, in a relatively short period of time, pre-public, okay? Not traded on an on a equity exchange. So China is not that far behind the United States. India is, you know, right up there, but it's basically global. It's, it's everywhere. You can find unicorns on, on the, in, in Africa now and so on. I expect this trend to continue. Um, it essentially democratizes the, um, the process. And what's driving, on, it, driving underneath it, of course, is the, um, is the mobile internet, right? So you have 6.8 out of 8 billion people uh, on the planet now have essentially the mobile internet at reasonably high speeds. And there's lots more to this story. It happens, it, it's very striking. The Indian case is very striking to me. So India, maybe seven years ago, had a relatively low penetration of the mobile internet. That means a device that's connected to the internet at reasonable speeds. Um, and the data rates were very expensive. And then they, um, Reliance, which is an energy company, entered the digital area with low cost phones and very low data rates. In India went kind of overnight from high cost, high data rate cost to low cost, almost free in some instances, low data rate cost, some of the lowest in the world and 400 million new users. Uh, and so what that did is create the kind of underpinning of this you know, digital ecosystem that's now developing very rapidly. So all of these things are going on. So the question, I guess, is, um, is what does it mean? I, to me, and so I'll conclude on this, to me, these tools are powerful enough that if they're directed in the right way, um, they, they actually do have the potential to produce not only a productivity increase, but a surge in in performance in multiple dimension, you know, multiple welfare dimensions, whether it's healthcare or education or any one of a number of things. We do need some breakthroughs. Um, we can't do the, the sustainability challenge without some technology we don't now have. Uh, I don't think we are the state of robotics is such that we can um, really deal with the productivity problem in the low productivity sectors yet. Um, there, there's technical reasons for this, but I think but most of you probably know that robotics, including autonomous vehicles and stuff, and just generally artificial intelligence driven things operate best in a structured environment. Okay. That is a thing, a relatively simple structured environment, like a manufacturing, you know, floor. And when you put them in an unstructured environment, they get confused. Um, so Kai-Fu Lee, who's a major uh, investor in, uh, in artificial intelligence, wrote the book, you know, comparing the AI developments in China and the United States, said the last thing that will be automated is what your gardener does. Right? Not because the gardener is highly paid, he didn't, you or she, um, it's because that's, the kind of his version of the ultimate unstructured environment with tree roots and stuff that we're not we're not close to being able to do that and there's a fair amount of that so i think one of the things i've been doing is talking to the people in artificial intelligence trying to think about what it would take to be to move these powerful technologies in a way that moves the needle into the low productivity sectors as opposed to just wherever they're going to end up um there's more to say about this, but I think, you know, so, so the, the question is, are we going to have kind of stagnation nation with or without inflation? I think the answer is we don't have to. Um, there's a way out. Um, it's driven by these very powerful technologies, um, but it'll take a concerted effort and a little bit of luck uh, um, to get there. Um, so it's not a pessimistic view of the world, but it's... Um, I like to think of it as realistic, Claudia, so I'll stop there.